Since the pandemic, we have been doing virtual conferences here at ResusX, and we never want to be one of those conferences that just did Zoom meetings because, frankly, they're boring and they suck, and we don't want you to spend your hard-earned CME money on something like that. So we've been putting on productions that we thought were above and beyond. But let me tell you, what you're seeing today is not something that just came together last weekend and we got in a room and got a computer and plugged people in. It takes a lot to put a conference like this on. And I want to take you behind the scenes for what goes into a conference like this. So come along with me and I'm going to take you along. We're in a studio somewhere in New Jersey. Bust open the doors. And here we are at Command Central. This is Ian, and that's John, and got a little Sham in the background there. But this is everything that goes into putting on a conference like this. This is actually $12 billion of technology put together in one afternoon to give you the trauma education that you need. So hopefully you are all grateful for all the hard work that these guys put in. I just come up with crazy ideas and somehow mm -hmm. they just execute on them. So without further ado, let's bring on our next speaker, Dr. Zaf Kasim, who's going to be talking about pregnancy and trauma. Let's go, Zaf. Great. Thank you so much again to the Rhesus X crew. What a great behind the scenes look there at all the hard work that's going on here. So let's uh, talk about uh, two trauma patients in one trauma bay. So this is probably something that uh, may be causing a little bit of uh, consternation to you. Uh, just to have a problem with their clicker, sorry. There we go. All right, so uh, we get the EMS report. Everybody's ready. They're kind of uh, in autopilot now. And suddenly the EMS uh, personnel report that this patient is 34 weeks pregnant. Oh, and you're like, oh, my God, I can't uh, handle this really well. I'm going to hide because I know that this is going to be a trap, right? Um, sorry, just having a problem with my clicker there. Let's start out. All right. So uh, next slide, please. So it, classic, right? This is going to be a trap um, because, you know, pregnancy can be a great part of life, right? So, you know, anybody who has kids out there, I'm sure they'll say, um, you know, it's it's been uh, at the end of it, a great experience. But as um, healthcare physicians and clinicians, we know that we've seen these patients who become so super sick. Um, and we've seen like the worst part of this spectrum of what should be a really good journey in this uh, woman's life. Um, but what is really challenging with our pregnant patient, and in particular our trauma patient, is we have to identify what is sick and what is not sick. So in order to do that, we need to really dig into what is normal pregnancy physiology. Because if you understand normal, then you'll able, be able to see what's abnormal. So if we start off with the cardiovascular system, so uh, these women will typically have an increased heart rate and a stroke volume, and in fact, their blood pressure drops whilst their cardiac output is increasing. So they'll have a little bit of hypotension, a little bit of tachycardia at baseline. That large growing uterus is really gonna be compressing that IVC. So when they're flat, these women will have a decrease in preload and they're really sensitive to those changes in position. And in addition, they might be a little bit more prone to having dysrhythmias as well. Think about that or uterus pushing up on that diaphragm. It's squishing now the thoracic cavity. Um, your lung volumes are decreasing, but at the same time, you have this increased oxygen demand. So your respiratory rate increases, your minute ventilation increases, and at the same time, you're also having these anatomical changes of increased vascularity in your airways that you'll need to uh, think about if you ever have to intubate these women. So if you get a blood gas, knowing that physiology, you will know that these women will have a little bit of a respiratory alkalosis because their CO2 should be low. So if it's a normal PCO2, so something that say my blood gas would show right now, this already implies respiratory failure in these women. Let's move on to the hematological system. So uh, there's a marked increase in the plasma volume as compared to the cell volume. So these women will have a natural dilutional anemia of pregnancy. 
But in, uh, uh, pregnancy is also an inflammatory state, and so a leukocytosis is not unusual, especially around the time of labor. When you look at the kidneys and the renal system, remember that increased plasma volume. So your kidneys are getting washed that much more often and that much faster. So the GFR is increasing, sometimes up to a third to 50% uh, of what it would be at baseline. And again, you might be faced with some of those obstructive path uh, path problems from the uterus. So hydroureter and other obstructive pathologies might be present there. Women in late pregnancy get edematous, and that's because the kidneys will preferentially uh, withhold uh, sodium and water. And so this becomes particularly important later on, and we'll come back to this. So what will the BMP show? So because of that increased renal flow, we would expect the creatinine to be low as a normal part of pregnancy physiology. So again, a normal creatinine here implies that renal failure is already uh, taking effect. Finally, let's talk about the gut. So the gut is sluggish. Ask anyone in an advanced pregnancy what they feel like. Early satiety, and because of a decreased lower esophageal sphincter tone, reflux is a big problem too. Um, and you want to be looking at uh, different markers uh, that might uh, show problems. LFTs are one thing you can check to, to see how the uh, gut is working. They should be normal by and large, except for the ALKFOS, which is typically elevated. But any other uh, elevation, say the transaminases, should be abnormal. All right, let's get back to trauma in pregnancy. So what's the incidence of this? Well, it can complicate up to 7% of pregnancies. And what's really important is to tease out the domestic violence that might occur. Unfortunately, this interpersonal violence seems to increase um, amongst pregnant women. And so really kind of think about that in the back of your mind when you're managing a woman who's pregnant who's been involved uh, or has sustained trauma. It can be really challenging to identify exactly what's going on here. And remember, part of that is because of the normal pregnancy physiology. So you'd expect a trauma patient to be a little bit tachycardic, hypotensive, maybe anemic, but those are all the things that are happening in normal pregnancy anyway. So how do you figure that out? And in addition to that, women can hide where they're bleeding, not only above and below the diaphragm, but if there's bleeding that's happening within the uterus itself, that's often not evident externally. And so you'll have to look for that specifically. And then, of course, don't forget the IVC. So the IVC will be compressed if we put these women in, in our typical position on a stretcher, which is flat on their back. Think about that hemorrhagic shock, hypovolemic already, and now you're decreasing the preload. Not a good combination for these women. So what are our priorities? As difficult as it is to say, and as much as we almost emotionally get drawn to the baby, the priority is mom. We have to treat mom first, because if we treat mom, we're actually treating the baby as well. But if you forgo that, then mom, unfortunately, may deteriorate and inevitably the baby will as well. So get help early. Get help from obstetrics. Get help from your surgeon. And you know, if you're out in a community shop, they may not be in house, but perhaps you've already talked about this and have say a telemedicine set up or an ability to call people in within a certain time frame. So figure that out uh, early because these patients will arrive to you. Get IV access, and just like with non-pregnant tra uh, non trauma patients, we want to get large bore peripheral IV access, ideally two of them. You can go for central access, but think about using uh, super diaphragmatic lines, so the subclavian or the internal jugular, and you want to be avoiding the femorals because of two reasons. One, it can be challenging to try and access the femorals with a big gravid abdomen in the way, but also remember, the IVC is being compressed. So whatever you might be pumping into that uh, IV you put in the femoral might not even be getting back to the heart. Think about giving blood, right? Give blood early because that's what they're losing. And typically, you know, we talk about giving O negative or type specific blood products to um, pregnant women. But there's been a lot of talk even earlier in the conference about the use of low titer O positive whole blood and I would advocate that you should give that to your pregnant uh, trauma patients as well. Because the risk of them developing isoimmunization in a future pregnancy is zero if they die from hemorrhagic shock during this incident. 
And if they survive and go on to have that potential complication, it's pretty easy to treat. So just don't worry too much about the rhesus uh, status. Think about your procedures. You're going to have to modify your procedures based on the anatomy that's changing, right? So, for example, if you're putting in chest tubes, think about going a couple of spaces higher um, than you would normally. Just to take account for that diaphragm, you certainly don't want to be doing a splenic or a liver biopsy by putting in the chest tube too low. And then think about the position that you're putting these patients in. So, again, with that IVC, Flat is bad, remember? So that IVC is being compressed, so either manually displace the uterus over to the left or put a wedge in under the right side of the patient and um, turn that patient off to the side a little bit to decompress the IVC. That will certainly allow an increase in preload and may show some uh, improvement in the hemodynamics just from an autotransfusion. All right, so now let's focus on the airway. So some of these patients will require intubation, but I would say that all of these airways are challenging. And that's from all the reasons that we talked about. So remember, you're gonna do an RSI and, a, and change this to positive pressure ventilation in a woman who's already got a low blood pressure to begin with and is very sensitive to, uh, to the IVC being compressed, so has a decreased preload. The uh, risk of aspiration is pretty high from all the natural GI changes that are happening in pregnancy. That salt and water retention can really come and bite you in the butt now because the airway is now edematous and vascular, and so you might not be able to use the usual size tube that you need to get to. And remember, these women have very little reserve. So that diaphragm is pushed up. They have a high minute ventilation at baseline. So there's going to be a really short time before they desaturate once you push that paralytic. So really prepare your team. Get your team all on the same page. Tell them this is going to be a difficult airway and to prepare appropriately, including having smaller size tubes, having multiple plans about if things go wrong, what to do next. Think about your positioning. Remember, flat is bad for a number of reasons, right? You don't want the diaphragm to continue to be pushing up against the lungs and decreasing your lung volumes even more. But you also want to avoid that um, uh, pressure on the IVC. So think about ramping up your patient to uh, a similar fashion to when we have patients with a higher BMI that we're intubating, really to allow that those airway axes to align and to offload the, uh, the diaphragm from the lungs. Pre-oxygenate well. So these women have very little reserve, so certainly use your apneic oxygenation techniques, nasal cannula oxygen, and I would strongly advise putting a PEEP valve on your bag valve mask to help facilitate their pre-oxygenation. And once you've intubated them, think about how you're going to ventilate them because you have to account not only for the pre-existing normal pregnancy physiology that's happened, so they naturally have a high minute ventilation and a uh, respiratory alkalosis at baseline, but in addition, they now have to compensate for likely a progressing metabolic acidosis from the trauma. So think about those things when you decide how to set, set up your vent. What about imaging? This is something that freaks out everybody, right? Including the radiology techs in particular. No, we can't image a pregnant woman. But I would say if they need to be imaged, don't hold back. So there's nothing worse than you deciding, oh, I'm just going to not do the scan. And then this woman unfortunately suffers because of a missed injury. So you can utilize the same imaging modalities that you're using with your non-pregnant patients. Uh, there is some data that's out there about different modalities. For example, the FAST scan, uh, although limited, it does show that there is a high sensitivity to this, but variable specificity. And some of the views might be a little bit challenging, like the super pubic view, just with the, uh, with the um, uterus being in the way. Finally, let's talk about that procedure that nobody wants to talk about, right? The resuscitative hysterotomy or the perimortem C-section. This really scares me, and I'm sure it will scare you if you ever have to face, uh, uh, come face to face with it. But again, think about this, how you're going to proceed with it, and what are your priorities. As much as we want to save baby, we need to save mom. That's why we're doing this procedure. And as difficult and harsh as it might sound, that's got to remain your priority. And in so doing, you have to be fast. So this has to happen within four minutes of the mother arresting. Um, so you have to be really slick at proceeding with this. 
and getting the baby out and continuing the resuscitation. And ideally, if the situation allows, two teams should be at work here. One to do the procedure and one to continue the focus on resuscitating mom using all those techniques that we've talked about through the, throughout this conference. Just some quick diagrams just to show the procedure itself. Again, not a cosmetic incision that you're making. You want to make a generous incision in the midline, right from the ziphy sternum down to the pubis. Open up your, uh, retract your um, abdominal tissue. Identify the bladder. You can retract that back and then make an incision in the superior pole of the uterus, usually a longitudinal incision. And then you can open that up using your scissors and uh, identify the fetus and um, deliver. Uh, you want to then look at the placenta as well, just to make sure that that's intact and not continuing to bleed, and then hand off the fetus to the team that will be resuscitating and focusing on the baby. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of an idea about how to approach your tra pregnant trauma patients. Let's just recap a little bit. Remember, pregnancy is a beautiful time in people's lives, but it can hide some really deadly pathology. And to identify that normal, you have to know what is normal in terms of your pregnancy physiology as they progress. Remember, your priority is to treat mom. And by treating mom well, you will treat the baby. Call for help early. This is not a one-man show that you're doing here. Get the help. It doesn't happen often. Get all these people on board, OB and trauma. Think about positioning, offload that IVC to improve your preload, and adjust your procedures to account for the anatomy, for example, chest tube insertions. Give blood. Don't worry about the RH too much. You can treat that later if the woman survives. Arrow management. Think about it being difficult and you won't go wrong and get imaging that you would do normally. Finally, the perimortem C-section, if you need to do it, you need to do it fast. Think about having those two teams so you can still focus on mom and make sure that the baby is taken care of as well. So just wanted to give a shout out to all my colleagues who continue to do all the great work that they do, even when they're having all those normal pregnancy physiology changes, I'm sure tiring out, doing this really sometimes thankless job. And again, thanks to all the team here at RhesusX for inviting me here. I look forward to chatting to you guys in the panel.